Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's terrific summer fiction program with Kevin Kwan and Jody Pico. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 25th season. Huge thanks to Kevin and Jody for joining us today. It's summertime, and what a perfect moment to sink into sex and vanity. Kevin's new novel, just out in paperback. Kevin pays tribute to A Room with a View, and it's a total delight. Our heroine, who is part Chinese American and part blue blood, wasp jumps into an identity crisis as she meets or really experiences high voltage electrical jolts with a guy who just doesn't meet her social expectations. Our heroine must decide in her fabulously crazy rich Asian way whether she'll opt for what's expected or go for what she wants. Sex and Vanity is utterly hilarious. It's full of social satire and the keenest observations. For those of us who really need some literary fun, this is the ticket. You know, best-selling authors might sometimes wish they could escape from the room their readers have stuffed them in. But Kevin Kwan will be known for eternity as our crazy rich Asian creator. And make no mistake, this book stands just as tall. It's so funny. And it's such great satire of everybody. I can't, I can't tell you, I love it. Um, it's, it has weighty underlying significance too. It's not just a riff. I love this. Um, you'll have questions, and I want you to email them to us at reservations at writersblockpresents.com, and we'll try to address them. Today is an embarrassment of riches for me. Jody is a wildly wonderful novelist whose books have sold in the countless millions. Her novels are at once witty, meaningful, and bring up questions that we as readers might not have realized that we harbored or suppressed for years. Her new novel, The Book of Two Ways, is a meditation on the roads we take, and it's, it's really wonderful, uh, and it's very moving. If you appreciate our programs, please feel free to make a contribution to our series on our website, and make sure you visit our website to find a link to Skylight Books, and we thank Skylight Books so much for everything and for sharing this program with us today. Um, remember, go to Skylight and get a copy of Sex and Vanity and The Book of Two Ways. I now am so delighted to give you Kevin and Jody. Thank you so much. Thank um, you, Andrea. Hi, Kevin, how are you? It's so good to see you again. <laughs> it's truly, truly a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having, you're having drinks, I'm having tea. So oh, sure. we're, ha we're having our, our happy that. hour. <laughs> I think you want it in there. You don't know. Um, well, you would know. Um, it's so brandy. I, I have to talk to you about this book because I emailed you when I read it last year. And I don't know if you remember, but that was, you know, it was still pretty early on in the pandemic. And I was so miserable because my whole life had shut down like everyone else's. But for the first time in my life, I had not been able to read. Since I was three, I could not read anything. And your book was one of the first books that completely captivated me and whisked me away, which God knows we all needed last year. <laughs> and so I, I still remain grateful to you, you know, for getting me out of my reading slump because it really was what kind of catapulted me back into life again. Um, so it's really a joy to be able to talk about this with you today. I, you know, that's amazing to hear. I mean, just, just that alone, we're done. <laughs> I can you die now. <laughs> you made one person happy during the pandemic. That's it. Yeah, You're that's it. That's yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad. And, you know, it's so funny because there was a moment where we were actually wondering, should we do this? Should we delay the book a year? You yeah. know, is it appropriate? Is it completely tone deaf to have a summer romp? You yeah. know, when everyone is stuck at home, unable to travel. And, and I really wanted to be mindful of that. And, Thankfully, right. my publishers talked me into do it, doing it. And, you know, right. I've heard from you now, but I, I've also heard from some other people who have told me that it really kind of, you know, gave them a laugh, gave them some joy. And that's all I ever want to do. You know that's what I mean? Cute. So, yeah, sometimes yeah. we need that. And, um, you know, you are the master of that. And I'm sure we're going to get to that. But, but we have to really start with the fact that we are both writers. You are way smarter than I am because when oh. you do research, <laughs> you go to places like Capri and I 
sit next to people who are dying, actively dying. That's the research that I did for the book of two ways. You know, it was, I don't know. I, I feel like I somehow took a wrong turn at, at author school. So could you help me? You know, well, I feel you got to do all the cool stuff. You got to go on digs. You got I, to go into ancient tombs in Egypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, um, I've, you've done I've, a lot of cool I, stuff for your other I, books. So I, I'm trying to copy you actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the but, my mistake was not writing this book in Capri. I thought yeah. that was the whole plan was like, okay, I'm doing this book. I'm going to go write in Capri. But of course I wrote it like right here in a corner, you know, in, in LA, okay. like in a fevered well, frenzy. You, you, you failed writer school too then. Because I know. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I love that you, you have, you have so many of, you know, your, your crazy rich Asians trilogy. And now this, there's just so much jet setting there's we are getting glimpses into a world that most of us are not living in but i like to pretend that you live in it so tell me that you do no <laughs> <laughs> um i really don't i i have to tell you i mean it it might appear that way i don't know to some people but i i wish i had that life and in many ways i'm glad i don't quite frankly do you like um, feel like a voyeur? Like, how do you get access to the, these rich and famous people when you're like, you know? You know, it's it's so interesting. It's just a happenstance. Um, really? They find me. I, I don't, I really don't know how to, you know, I, I always tell people like, I'm a writer, you know, for 22 years, I lived in the village. I lived, you know, like, <laughs> I don't have a jet set life, but right. I've always been, you know, I guess, first of all, I was born in a very unique family, you know? where we, you know, we were fortunate, but we were not crazy rich at all. But for some reason, you know, all my mom's friends were crazy rich. Um, so I, I got to see houses with shark ponds in the middle of the living room. You know, I got to meet people who had private jets in the seventies, you know? Um, and so back then as a kid, you don't know that's not normal. That's just your reality. It's not my reality, but it's what I knew. It was the reference points. I'd hear these stories. I would witness crazy, crazy stuff happening. Yeah. And I didn't know it was crazy until I moved to the US when I was 11. That's when it was like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is how, this is a whole different life, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. This is, I'm gonna get used to that. It's cool. So I had that for 10 years and then I moved to New York and suddenly, you know, I was thrust into the crazy rich world of crazy rich New York completely by happenstance. You know, I, I can trace it to really just one decision. You know, I was interning at Interview Magazine and oh, okay. I did not know, you know, that there's this unofficial policy that most of the other interns had to be heiresses or, you know, future tycoons. And I was the one <laughs> seriously not in that category, you oh, know, but God. there were some amazing people who worked there. Um, and we just became friends because we were all slaves. We're sitting right. there folding media kits till our fingers bleed, right, you know, right. or we're staying up at night doing all the dirty work and stuff like that. And that, that's how you bond. And then you realize, right. oh, come out to the country with me, come out to the East Hampton. And you realize they have these fabulous weekend lives right. and why not? So it was all accidental. Yeah. Quite I mean, frankly. I, I, what cracked me up about Sex and Vanity is, you know, there's a lot in there about the Hamptons because I would say the book is split into two mm -hmm. and the second half, you know, really focuses there. And um, I grew up on Long Island. And I did not. Grow I did. Up I did not know that. Well, I, I didn't know that you entered yeah. the interview. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am. Um, I did not grow up in the rich part of Long Island at all. You know, and my dad worked on Wall Street, and he commuted two hours each way into the city mm -hmm. on the Long Island Railroad. My mom was a nursery school teacher, but after prom, we snuck out to the Hamptons and we would, you know, party on the beach and, and drink and stay and watch the sun come up. And, and that was like, that was where the, the chic people went, you know? And now I know enough people in New York who actually, you know, take a helicopter out to the Hamptons on Fridays to recognize that that lifestyle is very real and very accurate, you know? But I, when I read your books, what I love is that there is, um, there's a real tongue in cheek quality about it. Like you're part of the party, but you're also sort of um, almost, I think, gently mocking them a little bit, you know? And I wonder if you do that on purpose, if you feel like you're indulging this lifestyle or if you're gently mocking or if you're criticizing priorities, like where do you think you fall on that spectrum? 
Yeah, you know, I think it really depends on the character. Sometimes yeah. I am gently mocking and sometimes I'm just, I'm going for it. You know, like this is a ridiculous person. And, you know, <laughs> you know, for example, Baron Mordecai von Efrussi, um <laughs> from my book, okay. you know, like he's modeled after a real person, right? And so it's, it's my way of like, just, I don't know, getting my revenge, I you love know, it. because yeah. I, I just, to me, snobbery and pretension is just innately hilarious. Right. You know, we all go to the bathroom, even the Queen of England, right? Oh. <laughs> we, we are all fragile creatures at the heart of it, you know? Right. So, and when I meet people who feel like they are better than you for some reason, mm -hmm. and it's usually never the reasons that are valid, quite frankly, you know? Yeah. Um, I just think that's hilarious. It's like, yeah. by, by what? Because you were a member of Lucky Sperm Club? You know? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Or because um, you, you happen to work in an industry where you're overly well compensated compared to the rest of the world. Like, right. Right. you know, sure. I do have judgments to it. And I try to dial that back. And I try to look at these characters. You know, they, they, they present themselves to me. And so I have this relationship with each of them. I mean, and some I would, I'm kind to too, and some I, I'm not as kind. <laughs> I would say, like, when I read you, I think a lot of like a modern day Noel Coward or Thackeray or something like that, which is meant as a huge compliment. Thank you. I, I totally take that as compliment. Yeah, yeah. that's what I, I think of. Like, that's the genre, that, the footsteps you've been following in, which I think is what makes it so enjoyable for the rest of us to read who are not hanging out in the Hamptons on weekends. Um, but let's backtrack to the actual... I guess the origin kind of, of the story, this is kind of a remake of um, A Room with a View. So tell me a little bit about why, why you decided to drop that plot into the world of uber rich Asian characters and why you even thought that was something to do. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to challenge myself in a whole new way, yeah. you know, and I've seen other people pay homage to great books. Um, you know, Zadie Smith, yeah. Did that with Howard's End, mm -hmm. for example, you right. know? And I was like, well, if she can try Forster, I can try Forster too. Like, but she's tackling the serious stuff, you know? Right. I'm yeah. taking his light, lovely, you know, comedic, but yet brilliant book. And it's, first of all, it was one of my favorite books. You know, I read it in high school, yeah. Yeah. absolutely loved it. And then I saw the movie and I was like, oh my God, there's a place called Italy. I want to go now, <laughs> you know? Right. And so I just fell in love with that world. And so the idea really began brewing about 10 years ago, you know, of like, you know what, I can take this story, but wouldn't it be great to really tell it, put Lucy, his Lucy, Lucy Honey Church, transform her and bring her to 2020? What would, what would that be like? You know, I want her to face similar struggles, but we have to make them real for her world. Right. But I also want to talk about other issues like, like race, you know? Yeah. and representation and identity mm -hmm. and the microaggressions that can exist even within your own family right. especially because we're all becoming so much more blended you right. know we're all becoming multiracial yeah. how do you reckon with that mm -hmm. and then how do you also reckon with the intermarriage between classes mm -hmm. because that hap that's happening more and more now you yeah. know as there's this one percent and the rest of us right, right? Some people are going to succeed in marrying up and there will be consequences. Right. And it's interesting that you talk about that because I think your books sit very squarely at the intersection of race and class. And I do want to go back mm -hmm. and talk about race. But um, but there's I remember when I was when I was doing the research for Small Great Things, which was really focused on um, African-American uh, racism against African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to some some black women who were trying to explain to me that there's a point where you're so rich that you're not black anymore. Like Oprah belongs to everyone. Do you know what I mean? Right? Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I think that is kind of, I think you're saying that too, in a way, except there's something different about, from what I can see in your books, Asian culture, because there's really this preservationist instinct to that heritage, no matter how rich you are. Am I getting that right, do you think? I, I think there, there is for, for many families. Yeah. And I think that was a belief system that existed, um, especially for the overseas Chinese, you know, the, the people who, who left and, and moved to Singapore and Hong Kong and the US and all that. I don't know if that's necessarily true for the new generation of new money mainland Chinese, hmm. you okay. know, 
um, because they're, you know, we're all different, right? And, and they're rewriting the whole rules of engagement. Um, it's so funny you mentioned that about, you know, sort of being so rich and black. I, I heard the, the new term now, someone was commenting on my social media saying, you know, I've now experienced shopping while Asian American. Oh. Because when you are Asian American and you go into a nice boutique and yeah. the minute you speak English, they ignore you. Because, because they know you're just an American. Right. You're, you're just an American. Right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you're not, you know, if you're speaking Mandarin, they flock to you and they start sucking up, you know, because they know you're going to be shelling out that cold, hard cash. Right. But right, right. so it's, it's interesting to see even these new facets and nuances to, to, to what it's like now, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. So let's talk a little bit about race. Let's dive a oh. little deeper into that. Um, Lucy's mixed race. And that I think is a really important, Thing in this book um, in a way it's like um, I like to think it's like the whack on the back of the head like you're, you're getting us when you don't people don't expect to be thinking about race in a book that is supposed to be light and fluffy and entertaining but you really do make us think about it a lot and I want to hear from you how you feel her the two cultures that are literally in her bloodstream really impact her character and you know for someone who hasn't read the book yet basically isn't it her father who is is white her father's wasp you know he comes from blue blood new york family and his mother her mother is middle class asian american and her brother can pass as white and she can't yes she can't right. she looks more like her mother she looks right. more chinese even though she does look mixed race you know right. okay. um but she gets mistaken for being chinese her brother looks like he stepped out of a j crew catalog as right. a, and doesn't her grandma call her like her little china doll or something like her that? her little china doll which you yeah. know she means of all the goodness and right. affection of her heart but she doesn't realize right. you know from her generation that this this to, to lucy growing up it's a cutting remark you know right right um so and why is it important to you to write about that i felt it was yet again something that very few people people have looked at mm -hmm. you know in in contemporary fiction Right. Um, there are very, very few contemporary protagonists who are mixed race and who are biracial Asian in that way. And I grew up with a lot of my cousins are, you know, um, I think the preferred term these days is Hapa, which comes okay. from the Hawaiian, you know, mixed race. So I have a lot of cousins who are Hapa. I have a lot of really, really good friends who are also Hapa. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, it's such an interesting time to be looking at this group of people and what they have to go through when they choose to live in the West yeah. or what they have to go through when they choose to live in the East. Mm -hmm. And it's not a monolithic experience by any means. Yeah. You know, it's, it's and so it, dependent it's, it's on, comfort, I think in both worlds, you're never enough for either one. Yeah, right? exactly. You know, um, um, a friend, a Hoppe friend actually said to me a few nights ago that it was so rare for him growing up to meet another Hoppe that it was almost like he would be in shock that there was another one of him mm, in yeah. a room, you know, when, it, when he would go to a social situation or something. Right. And because I think growing up, he really felt like a complete alien, mm. you know. Um, conversely, I have another friend who grew up in New York, um, you know, Hapa, not a problem, not a care in the world mm. because she grew up in New York in the 90s, right? Went to school. Dozens yeah. of hoppas. It was the cool thing. And she was the cool chick in school. Mm. You know, that actually made her, her being hoppa made her cool. Yeah. Um, so you, you really, see, it runs the gamut of experience. And it's yeah. so dependent on, on where you live, who your parents are, how you're educated, and what you're taught to appreciate. Right. You know? But one of the fun things I think about this book is that Lucy, almost like on page one, I don't feel like I'm really giving much away. Yeah. Instant dislike to George. Right, which says so much more about Lucy than it does George. <laughs> and, totally. And George yeah. is like he's this guy who is really comfortable in his Asian skin, right? He so, truly is. Yeah. I mean, to me, that was that was a really cool way to set up. You know, you you think you're following, you think you're following your main character, and what you're actually doing is setting up her biggest shortcomings in the first few pages with her interactions um, with George, who she, you know, spends most of the book trying to figure out the great source of her discomfort with him, which, you know, 
that opposites attract things working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and I love George. I thought he was great because he, he was, he was just exactly who he was, whether that was dorky, whether that was Asian, whatever it was, mm -hmm. he was happy who he was in his own skin. Um, so tell me a little bit about the characters and where they came from and which one you're more like. <laughs> I mean, you know, I would like to say that I'm, I'm, I'm more like George and in many ways, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have his abs. <laughs> First of all, I don't have his tan. I don't surf. I wish I did. But, you know, it's interesting because for me also, I think having grown up in Singapore the first 11 years of my life, yeah. by the time I came to the US, I was truly comfortable in my own skin, you know? And yeah. Singapore was, you know, I was fortunate that that's where I grew up because it was already such a multicultural country. You know, it's a country where Europeans, Chinese, Malays, Indians, peoples of all races. You know, my neighbors were Australian, New Zealander, Indian, Chinese. Yeah. Like we were like, you know, model UN, right? Growing up. Yeah. So when I moved to this country, I didn't feel like I was inferior to anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that make, that being Chinese necessarily made me nerdy or geeky or, yeah. or other, you know, I was just, this was just my new life. And these are American kids. And I know, I know plenty from growing up and, yeah. you know, and I noticed it was interesting. Yeah. The Asian American kids wouldn't talk to me. They really froze me out, you know? Yeah. And I was a big flirt back then. Shocker. Shocker. <laughs> and I remember one day I was flirting with this, you know, cheerleader, you know, uh. um, beautiful cheer blonde cheerleader. And this Asian kid in my class, he was like, how dare you? What are you doing? And I'm just like, I'm not computing, you know? It took me a few years to actually unpack what he was experiencing. Yeah. But to him, I was embarrassing the hell out of him, you know, because he had learned these rules growing up as an Asian American. It's like, you're not supposed to talk to the cheerleaders, stay in your own lane. Hmm. And here is this kid who he sees as, as Asian facing, but who's not yeah. playing by those rules, yeah, yeah. you know? Okay. And it somehow made him uncomfortable yeah. and he thinks it's kind of somehow reflect badly on him. That's, you know, how I'm able to understand that. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, Lucy is that guy, yeah. you know, she's embarrassed yeah. by George that he is so comfortable in his own skin that he can wear a white Speedo and go diving, mm -hmm. right? He's right. Australian. A yeah. lot of them wear Speedos, you know what I mean? Yeah. deal with it if you've got right? the abs wear the speedo I exactly always... right but she's like oh my god like he's making a spectacle of himself oh my god he's so weird he's right. not he's just being purely who he is but she can't do that because she has not grown up with that experience right. she has grown up sublimating herself sublimating becoming who people need her to be exactly and and so much of that is tragic because you know she's in this waspy park avenue world and she looks like a very beautiful, but Asian Chinese girl. Right. So no matter how much she tries to hide, right. you're not escaping what people right. are seeing. And, you know? and she has to build up all those walls. Yeah, and then there's George's mom, who is even worse because, yeah. you know, she is very comfortable in her culture. And exactly. she's not hiding any of it at all. Um, she's 150,000% <laughs> you know, crazy rich Asian, basically. Right, right. <laughs> and she's gonna right. let it and all hang out. Apologetically happy to be that. Exactly, with her Elizabeth Taylor jewels and her turbans and her caftans, and she's just right. having fun. Yeah. And right. enjoying her life and right. telling it like it is, you yeah. know, and Lucy, has, who has grown up in this, you know, very composed world. Right. Um, where it's, you're never supposed to express how you truly feel. Mm -hmm. um, right. This is just so alien to her be fair i mean that she's getting that from her wasp half as well <laughs> no no absolutely yeah. that's that's what i mean you yeah. know yeah, yeah so she's she's grown up with so many mixed messages and she's internalized all that so yeah. she's a she's a royal mess yeah. you know in the same way that lucy honeychurch i don't know if you ever read a room of the view yeah. um you know a long time ago yeah. she's a complete like, mess a because mess. Yeah. she's getting all these very victorian signals mm -hmm. you know she's had the misfortune of being born in 1908 Right. where she's inheriting all the baggage of a hundred years of Queen Victoria. Right. 
and right. all the repression and oppression yeah. that it entails. And this is a new age, and 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 you know the the yeah. suffragist movement is, is is coming to life. Women are asserting themselves in whole new ways. You know, you're allowed to love who you want to love. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know that yet. She didn't get that memo because she's stuck right. in you know the squirocracy. You know that sort of aristocracy yeah. of, of the shires. You know. Right. And I mean, what I love, you know, I I write a lot about things that are controversial, difficult. I, I like to say I write about the things nobody wants to talk about, you know? You, you really do. And you have a way of magic with, with well, making it but, fun and never pedantic, you know? Which is very kind of and, Thank you. Yeah, that's I mean. That's what I love about this book because I when I finished it, I was, I told you, I was like in this rut. I was a zombie. And, you know, I was so delighted to be swept. I could tell you exactly where I was when I was reading it. I remember everything about it. And I was like, just obsessed, just kept reading it and reading it. And I felt so liberated when I was done because I was completely swept away. But I was left when the last page was turned thinking about these big questions about race and representation and shame and culture. And I was like, damn, Kevin Kwan, you know, you took what is supposed to be a fluffy little light read and you made me think hard. So, I mean, hats off to you, but is that something that that you feel you do intentionally? Are you trying to, you know, sort of sugarcoat us with opulence, and then, by accident, get us thinking about deeper issues? Um, simply yes, yes. yes. absolutely. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's yes. it's something I've done since book one. You know, yes. um, right. most people have never articulated it in in the way that you do so beautifully. You know, um, so thank you. I really appreciate that because. You know, I think so many people look at a book and judge it by its cover and just go, oh, this is chick lit, yeah. this is fluff, this is whatever. And, you know, I don't design my covers. I have no control over them None of us whatsoever. Do. You know, mm -hmm. I love them. They really work. I have complete respect for the genre, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I just do what I do, right? <laughs> yeah. And I feel like in everything I write, I'm always exploring. I'm always trying to understand also, yeah. you know, and I'm taking my, my readers on this journey with me. Yeah. Um, and some will get it and some don't care and, and some right. won't get it. And I don't know, we're all just trying to figure it out, right? That's right. what we're trying to and, do. But I mean, so I, I, I really appreciate your, your oh, saying. Of course. And I mean, I think yeah. as any writer knows, you can't, you can't please everyone all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, you're not really writing to please everyone. You're writing the story you need to write. And that's important to you to write. So you know, I, I think it's wonderful that, I, well, I love, I love your work, but <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, Likewise. Briefly pause here to say, this is a reminder. If you have questions for Kevin Kwan, please email them to reservations at writersblockpresents.com so that we can get your question to Kevin in about 15 minutes. Um, please okay. ask questions. Also to Jody, yeah. I guess, is Jody game for questions too? I mean, yeah, but okay. Actually, yeah. Gonna, can I tell you my Singapore story? Because I don't think I've ever told you this. No, you have I, not. Yeah. I did a book tour in Singapore. I don't know why, but I was invited to Singapore. And it was a book called Change of Heart, which was about, it was critical of the death penalty. Okay? Oh and so I'm like, it hit me sometime after I was standing at like the National Library, giving a talk to, you know, several hundred people as the the army or police i don't know who they were filed into the back of the auditorium with their guns and they're just standing there looking at me as i'm talking i don't know what they expected me to do or say but i i just remember thinking huh not what i expected to have <laughs> did you like the food the food was amazing did you enjoy the food before. yeah i loved it yeah it, where'd you stay uh you remember was it raffles Raffles, the old yeah. historic colonial hotel. Yeah, that's yeah. where I stayed. Yeah, very colonial. But it Fantastic. was my birthday and my, I, you know, every room is a butler. This is as close as I get to a Kevin Kwan novel. Um, my butler brought me a cake. <laughs> and oh. I was like, thank you. That's so nice of you. As yeah. he should have. Yeah. He really should have. So I'm glad. I'm glad you were taken care of, at least on that aspect. It was that's great. It was, so it was many, funny. many years ago, but it was yeah. really funny. Um, okay, next question. Can we talk about the footnotes? Absolutely. I mean... First of all, they're almost a whole book in and of themselves. And, you know, 
I am not a footnote girl. I usually do not want to read footnotes. I want to keep going. I want to learn about my characters. I want my plot. But you can't not read these. And they are hysterical and fabulous. So tell me why you decided to do that and if they are more fun than writing the actual book. <laughs> <laughs> They are definitely more fun. And I save them for the last. I really do. Really? Uh, yeah, I you go through the book. You get your manuscript after you're done. That's when you pluck them in. Yeah. You know, a lot of times I'll make notations of where I want a footnote, but then more will occur to me as I go back and do the footnote pass. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because, you know, it really began with Crazy Rich Asians because yeah. so much of what I was writing then, and I, was, I knew I was writing for a primarily Western audience. That was my focus, right? There was stuff that I wanted to explain that I didn't want to explain within the within the book, within the story, you know. Yeah, okay. I wanted to translate yeah. cuss words, for example, yeah. you know. Right. Sure. I wanted to do that. Yeah. And so I did that and it was very they were very dry. They were footnotes, basically. Yeah. And my brilliant editor, Jenny Jackson, was like, give them a voice. I love it. Who is writing this? You know, and I was like, Oliver, of course, is writing yeah. this. You yeah. know, so I I rewrote all of them in his voice. And he's a snarky, you know, yeah. witty yeah. observer. You know, he's he's my Thackeray, basically. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so I right. adopted that voice for the three books in the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy. And right. this time, it's not in Oliver's voice. You know, he's not part of this yeah. book. Right. So you'll see the voice has shifted, but it's funny in a whole new way, hopefully. It's right? still, it's, it's, yeah. the, it's the observer on the sidelines making snarky comments still. Totally. Yeah. And they're much more interactive now. They are much snarkier, you know. Yeah. You don't really get that many explanations, but it's like kind of the Greek chorus in a way. Yes, that's a really good way you to know. Do it. Or like the narrator in uh, um, a uh, uh, Jane Austen novel. You Thank know, you. Yeah. 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 But yeah. it's just yet another way to add yeah. more story and more fun and make people laugh even more. Yeah. Oh, no, they're, they're hysterical. They're so good. Um, you chose to write this book in two halves, really, you know, because time passes in the middle mm -hmm. and you didn't want to take us through those years. You didn't, you, you know, you really jump time. Why? And do you really feel like, um, you know, I guess the question is like, my, my point of view is that you, this is Lucy's story for the most part. Mm -hmm. And usually you see your character begin to progress and learn stuff as, you know, a book goes on. I would argue that Lucy takes some giant steps backward before we get to the beginning of part two. So again, I want to know from a writerly standpoint, you know, was that intentional? Did you want to do that? Did you know you were going to do a time jump in the middle? I did. Well, you know, in Ian e. Forster's book, yeah. right, Room of the View, there is a time jump. And yeah. his time jump is, I think, like six months, mm -hmm. eight yeah. months, something like that. It's There's less than a year. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mine's five years. Mm -hmm. And... I felt I needed that time yeah. to really reset her in this other world. Because, you know, also back then, you know, his Lucy was 18 years old. They do get engaged at age 18, age 19. My Lucy starts out at 18. She ain't getting engaged at 19. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's just not realistic for her time. So I needed to give her time to get through college, start her, start her career, yeah. and be in a different place where she is ready to make a commitment to herself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, but it's so interesting that you see how much she's actually regressed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like oh, that's, that's the writer in you. That's a, yeah. <laughs> you know, because she's getting, she's gotten more, more and more enmeshed in that world, yeah. in that world of appearances, in that sure. world of, of, of the elite New York mm -hmm. bold face name, page six type people, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so with that comes the baggage. Right. 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 Um did you let's talk a little bit about I'm not going to call this a sophomore book because it's not your second book, but you certainly had a blockbuster trilogy. How did it feel moving out of that into a new story? Were you scared? Were you I, I, I it was leave all of them. <laughs> I felt liberated, you know, like you don't get it. You know, those, the trilogy was seven years of my life, wow. you know, yeah. writing about that same. It didn't feel that long for me. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, it was really focused on that world, yeah. you know, yeah. and I wanted to, I really wanted to do something different. Yeah. I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to be in new territory. Yeah. 
yeah. um, you know, not just geographically, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm trying to like stretch my wings sure. and do something slightly different. And I thought it's fun to kind of tr- crack that nut of the homage, you know, yeah. Um, but also to, to really be in new territory and, and be in a different right. space. And so I, I loved doing it, you yeah. know. I mean, I, I'm sure, first of all, I have, I have so many questions about this. I get asked all the time about writing sequels and I don't mm-hmm. write sequels, but I do bring characters back. And, you know, you could argue that that's a way to look at the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy as well, because you're telling mm-hmm. different, different stories along the way. But um I like I I don't understand someone who you know like writes twenty five books with the same character. I think I would throw myself out a window. I, just, I think I, I would too. Right? I, I would too. Yeah. People. I always say like by the time I'm done with a book, I feel like these are house guests that need to get out so I can change <laughs> the sheets already. You know, and then, then when you get your your book back for copy editing or first pass pages or even when you see it published, you're like we had such a good time the last time you were here, but you need that distance, right? I, I totally agree. Right. Yeah. So, so. I, I, mean, I get it. Um, but you also did something different here and that you, this is the first book where you wrote about Asians who were living outside of Asia. So. And that was intentional, you yeah. know. And because you really wanted to kind of dive into what it was like here in America or. Yeah. What it's what, actually what it's like for Asians living in the West. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and because this Sex and Vanity is the first book in a trilogy of sorts. Oh, you're doing it again, Kevin, huh? Well, no, not really, (laughs) because Lucy's story is, has finished, you know, spoiler alert, it's done by the time we get to the end, right? It is. Um, so I'm calling this- Thank God she figures things out. Yeah. (laughs) Or does she? Um, but yeah. I like to think so, yeah. Exactly. But I'm calling this my city's trilogy because- each book will pay homage to a different city. You know, this first one was obviously New York. Right. The next book is London. The, the last book in the trilogy is going to be Paris. But it'll be totally different characters. But the through line is that they're all, they all involve Asians living in Paris or Asians living in London, you know, all, or New York. This is me telling you that you're going to write the next books in London and Paris. <laughs> I was I was planning Kevin that. Visit, okay. That was I that was the plan, you know, I was going to move to to London last fall after oh, my right. after my happen. crazy book tour for Sex and Vanity which did not happen. Um happened virtually. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, but that I would love to make that happen and you are more than invited and we will have tea in London. Tea and and and, and 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 wine and champagne in Paris. How's that? I love it. That sounds yeah. so good to me. Oh, that's really cool. So are you also going to pair them with a classic book or not? I will. Are yeah. you going to share with me what the next one is? No, I can't. Gosh, I can't. Really? Because, yeah. Have I you started can't. writing it? I haven't. Okay. I mean, you know, you know, I guess in my mind, I'm composing. I'm yeah, yeah, I know creating it. I'm just dating, you know, just like you I do. I call it percolating. Percolating, yeah. Yeah, that's what it feels so like. So things have to percolate. Then I have to get over there and check into a hotel and live there and and bed yeah. and spy and on people london first and then paris and then paris that's, act- that's going to work out very well because i'm going to be in london next year so <laughs> this is a standing date see you so, there okay <laughs> um so now let's talk uh before we switch over to people's questions i want to talk a little bit about movies because your experience with films is about as antithetical <laughs> to my experience with films as humanly possible from what i can tell you really enjoyed that process and even more to the point, you were a part of the process of translating your book into film. Is that accurate? That is that is absolutely er- accurate. And it was, I know now, a complete unicorn experience. Yeah. You know, um, I am, unfortunately, one of the few people that actually had a decent, you know, that's not to say there weren't moments of heartache, right? In every, in every process, there is heartache. But for the most part, it was kind of a dream situation. Um, really thanks to John Chu, you know, um, he really, you know, felt that he wanted me along for the ride to, to help give this, the authenticity it needed, you know, he respected that. Yeah. But not only that, I think 
I think that directors or writers or showrunners who understand that there is a core audience of people mm -hmm. who loved your book. And it's not that they're expecting to see it replicated page for page on the screen. We're all, mm -hmm. We all know that can't happen. Yeah. But to know that they're keeping true to the heart of it and the characters, that's a tremendous gift. And that's all I hoped for, you know, that, that the film would bear some DNA yeah. from the original, you know, and it accomplished that so beautifully. I think because he really cared about yeah. getting the story right. It, it became a very important story for him, yeah. you know, um, to tell and to, to, to get it right. And he knew that, you know, three billion people were, were waiting and watching, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and he had to do, he had to do justice to this, and he knew like this has to work, and it has to be believable to Asians living in Singapore and Hong yeah. Kong and Taiwan and yeah. my family in California and yeah. all the Asian Americans you know right. in America. He he knew yeah. yeah piece of cake, and he he managed that. So I was so truly lucky, you know, and it was so much fun to get involved in the areas where I liked to get involved in. Like I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with the screenplay. Thank God. Interesting. Were you asked to? I was invited to at the very beginning, you know, um, Nina Jacobson, who was also the other unsung hero, you know, from the very beginning who, who took a risk with this book yeah. at the time. It was not a bestseller. You know, it was, how was it even out yet? But she wow. saw the story, thought it was amazing. Oh, good. And she said, do you want to adapt this? And I said, hell no. Hell no. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, like if we get a chance to actually make a movie, yeah. I want the best team possible. You know, yeah. you are the best team possible. Let's get the best screenwriters, the best directors. And I don't want to be in charge of screwing this up. Yeah. You know, how, I, long, how long was it between the publication of the book and the movie? 2013, the book yeah. came out in the summer and the movie came out in the summer of 2018, Five which, years. you know, yeah. fans were complaining that it took so long, but I'm told in the history of Hollywood, that's actually pretty quick. It is it's quick. usually eight to 10 years. Yep, I know. Um, so yeah. yeah. That's wild. Yeah. And so are they, they're doing the next one, right? They're doing the next one. Are you involved Yet, in that as well? I am, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still, a, yeah, I'm a producer as well. So I consult basically on whatever they want me to. And once again, they feel the pressure, right? They, they want this to be like Godfather 2. They well, want- Especially because the first one was such a successful movie. Exactly. So they can't screw this up and they're really spending the time to really, really get the script perfect. And, you know, there was a chance it was going to go into production last year. It of course didn't happen and everything's yeah. just been, you know, yeah, as I you know, know, domino effect. Right. Sure. So. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. And then there's Sex and Vanity. You know, Sex and Vanity is going to be a movie as well. I did not know Hopefully. that. Hopefully. Knock on uh, wood. Tell yeah. me more. What else do we need to know about this? I didn't know that. Yeah, Sony bought the rights amazing. and they they love it so much. And we have an amazing screenwriter working on it. Um, so, cool. so it's it's full speed ahead. And maybe this will happen, you know, in less than five years. <laughs> yeah, well, you're yeah. like a freaking quantity now. So that's, yeah. that's absolutely possible. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. Okay, I think I probably have time for one more question, um, which is going to be about the pandemic and how you were affected by it creatively. I'm asking everyone this. Yeah, I'm you know. Like, I don't want to talk about it, but I feel like we need to. Totally. It was, you know, we all had a strange experience, right? For you me, the <laughs> yeah, the first few months were just intense shock and fear oh. and grief. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to start a book tour, Yeah. right? Like in the midst of it. Um, and thank God I had something to do. You know, yeah. And thank God for Zoom. You know, yeah. and I remember we did an event together for yeah. your amazing book. Uh, which when is your book coming on paperback? September. September. Coming September, and then I have a hardcover yeah. coming on uh, the thirtieth of November. Yeah. Well, I I don't need to help you sell books, but just to everyone here who has not read the book of two ways, <laughs> please do yourself a favor. It is just the most magnificent special oh, book and it's sure. also one of the special books that I will always remember because I read it in the middle of the pandemic I and I remember you know I I was so happy to do this event for you you sent me an early galley and I opened page one I was like you're kidding me right it's a deaf it's a deaf doula 
I know. Well, it oh might my god, I'm like during the pandemic. <laughs> I know. I, so I had this knee jerk reaction of of fear of like, oh my god, I promised her I would do this, but I don't know if I can read this book now. Yeah. And I did, and by page four, I was like, okay, I yeah. I see what she's doing, and and it's such such an escape for me. So I escaped into your book, you know. Well, that's very kind of you. In the most amazing way, nice. but. Yeah, so it was weird, and I did this tour, and I think there for me the the turning point was when all the phase three trials mm -hmm. were coming back, and the results were so positive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And it's like, okay, this is real. There will be a vaccine. There might be an end to this. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not all going to be stuck in our little rabbit holes forever. You know. And then of course, you know, things changed right. as the vaccine actually became a reality. Yeah. And um, just knowing that and just seeing the vaccine campaign begin really was a turning point for me, I have to say. Yeah. And yeah, sure. suddenly I could be creative again. Yeah. So I've written, I've actually written a screenplay. Amazing. Yeah, with, with a friend, with a writing partner. And yeah. I've created a, a new TV show and suddenly I had this, you know, late winter, early spring of like full creativity mm. um, in a way I never expected because yeah. most of last year I was a zombie. I was just like, yeah. let's just try to survive and yeah. be present and be in the moment and be grateful yeah. and try to stay healthy and try to, you know, look after yeah. our families, you know. But I'm in a different headspace now, and I'm so grateful that I was yeah. actually able to create something in the midst of all this. And I think you know? it's so interesting that you were creating in a different, you were writing, but you were writing in a different genre. Because the writing I did, the first writing I mm -hmm. did, was um, writing the libretto of a musical with my writing partner. That's and it was, again, I couldn't so write amazing. a novel. I was like, I don't yeah. know how to do this. Yeah. But we were able to create a musical you know, during this time, which again, was like, it was, literally like reverse jerry-rigged engineering to create a musical when there is yeah. a theater. But um, you had to tap into your joy, right? And your joy comes from creating, but you it had to come out in a different way. And for you, it was that. It was through the music, yeah. through the libretto. For yeah. me, it was actually collaborating. Right, that's with, what I was gonna with, say. With You're a friend. held accountable to someone else. I'm held accountable, right? Yeah. And, and he came over, yeah. he sat in my garden yeah. six feet away. We both had masks on with our laptops. Yeah. You know, thank God for final draft collaboration. Yes. You know what I mean? I like <laughs> we could actually, you know, be yeah. together, but safely yeah. Yeah. isolated. And yeah. there was such, you know, I think it really kind of, it kept me alive really yeah. just to do that and to be, and to be transported into creating something that's in a whole different space. You know? I, I actually saw my co-writer for the first time at the premiere of this musical a couple of weeks ago, because we're all vaccinated now. It was an amazing moment. And I, I mean, I see him almost every day on FaceTime because we're working together. Mm -hmm. But he gave me this big hug and he goes, you still have legs. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> That's really, really funny. Um, so you're going to be in London for the musical. No, different musical. <laughs> different musical. Okay. So you've yeah. got, you've got so two musicals going. Breathemusical.com. Yeah. And it's yeah. streaming actually, because we can't be in the theater yet still. Um, and it's really, I'm really proud of it. I really am proud of what we created. It's really a look at how five different couples were affected by the pandemic. And you can, you can all go buy a ticket tonight and watch it on your TV screen when you're done with this. And then, Sold. Um, yeah, the one Sold. that's happening in yeah. London is um, The Book Thief, an adaptation of The Book Thief. So, well, hi, that be cool. welcome back, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, so you're talking about musical adaptations. I'm just throwing in one off the cuff because we have lots of questions here. But Kevin, could you see any of yours being musical adaptations? You know, only if Stephen Sondheim okay. or Jody Pico did, did the, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, if you're not gonna trust me with it, Kevin, gosh. <laughs> I could totally see your stuff as musical, 100%. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
So I, I have a lot of questions here. Um, let's start with, uh, I'd love to hear more from Mr. Kwan about using luxurious writing to encourage examination of big issues and social commentary. Uh, for example, Shakespeare Theater DC's book club read Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah, you know, for me, the use of, of luxury brands, labels, all that, it really began at satire. Um, because I would, I remember going to Asia and going to Hong Kong in particular, you know, as a, as a teenager and in college and the people there were always so fascinated by what I was wearing, you know, and then they would demand to look at the labels of my shirt or my watch. And I was like, what is this obsession with the brand names, you know, um, because to me, you know, I had grown up in a world where it's tacky to ask people, oh, what are you wearing, you know? And what's the brand of your scarf, Andrea, you know? <laughs> so it was so strange to me, but there it was just, that was just part of the culture, right? And I would go out to, to, to a family lunch with friends and stuff like that. And after lunch, after dim sum, they would all go as a family to Gucci to shop. <laughs> And I was like, this, I, you can't even make this up. I have to write about it. So it really began as social co commentary. Um, and it's interesting because we didn't know if it would work. We didn't know how people would respond. And by the time the first book came out and then the second book hit, the response was, please, more, more, more. <laughs> more of the luxury porn, please. <laughs> so it kind of backfired in a strange way because it wasn't my intent. To, to sort of glorify the brands of the world, but it's just, it's inherently a part of who these people are. So when you're writing, I'm just sort of yeah. taking off from this question because I, I love that too. And, um, you know, my friend made this scarf, so <laughs> yeah. there's no brand attached to it, but um, can you look at characters in your book without seeing brands attached? Can, you know, well, in the new book, yes. And there are far less brands in the new book, but in the last three books in the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy, it's the brands are so much, they, they, they are such signifiers of who they are, you know? So it's, it's interesting to play that game of, of dressing these characters and seeing what is important to each and every one of them. And, and for some, it's, it's not important at all. Whereas for others, they use brands to define themselves, you know? And, and so it's part of their costume, it's part of their armor. And so I, I had to showcase that. So there's, there is a way of looking at it where I'm observing and commenting, but beyond that, for some of these things, there is appreciation, you know, beyond the brand itself. You're looking at the artistry of something, the craftsmanship of something, you know, beautiful jewel is a beautiful jewel. The character, this, this next question, is a, a perfect follow-up. Um, the characters in Sex and Vanity are all described in terms of their academic ped pedigrees and the fashion that they're wearing at the moment. Is there a connection, do you think, between fashion and education? And how are these things important in the representation of Asian characters in your fiction? Wow, that's, um, that's a whole thesis project, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would say. You know, Fashion is important in the sense that it tells us who we are. You know, it has a, its role in society and it has a way of capturing where we are in a certain moment in culture and time. Um, with the naming, and you know, there's a, this fun device for those who haven't read the book. Anytime a character is introduced in Sex and Vanity, it's immediately followed up by all their schools. It's their entire educational resume. And that was my way of kind of satirizing this set of people, you know, for a lot of New Yorkers, especially in elite circles, education and where they went to school is so paramount. It's about the connections they made from kindergarten, starting at St. Bernard's or starting at Dalton and going all through their lives to whichever Ivy League university they end up at. So that became a kind of a running joke throughout the book. And you see characters all over the world, you know, their schools are important because that's where we are in the culture. You know, we are obsessed with the prestige of 
schools as labels, as and prestige you, labels. Yeah, and you even assign one character a nursery school in LA, you know, and that was pretty funny too. And I'll jump in and say that as someone who's married to a Mayflower wasp lineage family, that is still very important. <laughs> Um, let it's me. a kinship between wasps and Asians, you know. It is. You know, like, they, they are all to some degree education snobs. Mm -hmm. um, please talk about the shockingly low percentage of Asian Americans in Hollywood movies. Do oh, wow. Do you view the success of the Crazy Rich Asians movies as a catalyst for change? You know, I hope it's a catalyst for change because it's, it's incredibly shameful that we are where we, at, we are at. And, um, you know, there was just a report released last week by, you know, one of these think tanks, I think it was Stanford actually, that, that really looked and they detailed exactly how often Asian characters appeared in TV, in movies, in plays, in all, all across media in America. And the percentages are so shockingly low but not only that, it's how Asians are portrayed and how they still continue to be portrayed, you know, um, in with so many negative stereotypes, overwhelmingly negative stereotypes. And so it's, you know, we are really at base camp of, of what needs to change, you know, because one movie every 25 years that has an Asian cast is, is really not enough, quite frankly. And somebody asks, do you think that the Crazy, Crazy Rich Asians trilogy and the new book, Sex and Vanity, will replace old stereotypes about Asians in American pop culture? I hope so. You know, you know I, I, I can't really be the deciding factor, but I, I really hope that it is somehow part of the conversation and, and, and part of the change. Yeah. Uh, Sex and Vanity dishes up hilarious clashes between old wasp money and new money. Which is better fodder for you as a social satirist of the highest order? I don't think either one is better. I think they, you know, they're, they're both, they both <laughs> give equal parts humor and there's ridiculousness in, in truly both. And, you know, really any social class, I think, has its own foibles and its own idiosyncrasies that can be mined for humor but it's, it's especially funny to, I think, poke fun at, at the, the privileged, right? quite, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah, and you do that so, yeah. it's, it's so great when you do that um, with elite universities, uh, with Lucy having gone to Brown, because Brown is a place where people read books and feel things, I think you said. <laughs> I think I laughed for about 48 hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. So violence is on the rise against Asian Americans. Is this something you'd incorporate into any of your novels? I mean, I may. We'll see. You know, I, I, I never really set out with a plan when I start writing. I just kind of begin with an idea and I, I let things just go where they want to. So I can't promise anything, but, you know, certainly it's, it's a very present problem that's happening in America that's very, very concerning. So you will be interested to see how this gets interpreted in my mind and, and what ends up on the page in the next few things that I write. This is a funny one that just came in. Wikipedia states that you're a wanted man in Singapore for failing to register for national service in 1990 and don't have a valid uh, exit permit to remain overseas. What's your take on this? It seems pretty funny, but it could also be disturbing that you can't go back to Singapore, which you left when you were a child. Well, all I can say is it's a Wikipedia page and okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't believe everything you read on Wikipedia because I certainly didn't write that and I have no control over what's put on it. Oh my I think God. it used to say I was 68 years old. So. <laughs> Wow. Oh, okay. Okay. I once said that I had gotten divorced and I was like, who would say that? Why would you do that? You yeah. know? And then I was yeah. like, my husband didn't edit it. It's, it's funny. <laughs> I, I was at a, uh, a weekend with the CEO of Wikipedia and I was like, can we just please just like 
just get the facts straight on my page. And he's like, I'm so sorry. We don't do anything. It's our policy. And, you know, living people really hate us because <laughs> it's like it's it's a problem when you're alive. But Wikipedia is much kinder to dead people. Um, and I quote, end quote. <laughs> um, here's a, a good question to wrap up with. Do you feel like you've become an unofficial pop culture spokesman um, or authority on what it means to be Asian American today? And how do you wear that mantle, if that's correct? Uh, I certainly hope not. Um, I don't want to be an authority on anything. <laughs> quite frankly. So, um, you know, I just try to do what I do and, and hopefully, you know, it makes people laugh. But, but I think the question has yeah. real validity because your movies have touched a nerve all over the world and your books have touched a whole bunch of nerves all over the world. And so, and your, your future movies or your pending movies will certainly do the same. So, you know, it's a, it's a really legit kind of. Uh, it is. It is, and I, I, did, I didn't mean to to slight the question yeah. anyway. It's, it's just very intimidating to think that I that I would be in that position. I don't you know, think. We've, I don't think yeah. Kevin's allowed to say that he is, but but I can anoint him as that. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give you that crown. Yeah. You can anoint me for anything, and I do appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank both of you for this really, really terrific and fun and wonderful program. Um, Jody's and Kevin's books are such wonderful treats, and I hope you go straight to Skylight. Uh, you can find the link from writersblockpresents.com. You will love these books if you haven't, you know, gobbled them up already. And uh, we'll see you soon. And thanks to both of you again. This was a wonderful hour. I really appreciate it. Thank you yeah. so much. So great to see you, Jody. And so thank you, Andrea. You, Kevin, yeah. have thank the best paperback tour ever. Thank <laughs> you. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you soon. And good luck to both of you. Thank you.